I'm going to show you something about sneezing that you won't know. And Zahn, I'm pretty sure that even as a doctor, you won't know this either. First of all, I need to get Zahn to sneeze. So why don't you try rolling up the corner of this piece of tissue paper and stick it in your nose. Really? Zahn, <laughs> cover your mouth. Oh, I'm covered in spit. So what happened there? I put something up my nose and my body just blew it out because I didn't like it. How does it clear your nose? Right, like you sort of go <laughs> like that and just blow everything out of your nose. That's what you think happens? Yeah. This is really good. So even doctors honestly think this happens when you sneeze and that is completely wrong. So you don't blow anything out your nose when you sneeze. Everything comes out your mouth. And we can prove it to you if you look at this video of me sneezing. OK, here we go. I'm going, I'm going, I'm gone. That's all saliva that was in my mouth, but nothing is coming out of my nose. It's only after I sneeze that my body will create mucus to flush out whatever irritated my nose in the first place, and that's when snot will come out of my nostrils. So we've shown you that when you sneeze, the spray only comes out your mouth. But imagine if Chris had been ill when he sneezed. Every single one of those droplets could have contained disease-spreading germs, and that's why it's so important to cover your mouth. Now we're going to show you just how big and powerful a sneeze can be. We're going to create our own work of art. We'll both drink different coloured liquids, then get a sneeze going to create our masterpiece. Get ready for germ art. OK, so you're going to go first? <laughs> That's really good. Thanks. <laughs> now you'll notice an amazing splatter effect, and that's all down to the speed our sneezes are travelling. 100 kilometres an hour, to be precise. And remember, if we were ill, that would all be germs. I really like what you've done there, though. You've really um, drawn... the nose right. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I don't know why everyone doesn't paint this way. Now, with all this sneezing, look what started to happen. Yep, snot. And that's the mucus our bodies have created to flush out what was making us sneeze. I hope we've painted for you a clear picture of why it's so important to cover your mouth when you sneeze. Use a tissue or do it into your elbow. Got a little snot. Your body is an amazing machine, but it can't do anything without your brain. Now, your brain is what makes you, you. But it also tells the different parts of your body what to do. So, if I want to move my fingers, I have to send an electrical signal from here to here. And that moves really fast. It goes at over 250 miles an hour. That's faster than a Formula One racing car. So, we want to know more about where in the brain these signals come from. And in order to do that, we're going to use this multi-pulse transcranial magnetic stimulator. It's a big magnet. But it's a cool big magnet. It sends electromagnetic pulses to the brain, which interfere with the brain's own electrical signals. And that means we can use it to work out which bit of the brain does what. Let's give this brain scrambler a whirl. Now, Chris, what I want you to do first of all is reach up with your left hand and pick your nose. All right. Perfect. Did it perfectly. That's lovely. Now I'm going to get you to do the same thing again, but this time I'm going to try and interfere with the brain scrambler. So, Chris, when you're ready, Pick your nose. Every time Chris's finger wiggles, that's the magnet or brain scrambler interfering with his brain signals, which means he can't pick his nose properly. You miss? <laughs> but the magnetic brain scrambler is also showing us which part of Chris's brain controls his left hand. I'm on the right side of Chris's body, but it's his left hand that's twitching. Now, that's because your brain is wired back to front. So the right side of his brain controls the left side of his body and vice versa. So let's now try it on the other side. And you ready? Go. So now I'm interfering with the left side of Chris's brain and look, his right hand is all over the place. <laughs> I feel like a cup of tea. That sounds lovely. Actually, it's me that's drinking the tea and it's cold tea, but you'll see why. I reckon we can have a bit of fun with this brain scrambler. Ooh, there it goes. <coughs> The brain scrambler is interfering with our brain's normal signals and it's creating a right mess. Ouch. 
we've got loads of amazing body tricks to show you. Here's how to confuse your friend's brains using just water. Wow. Right, this is cool. Zand, I need a bowl full of ice cold water. And now I need a bowl full of medium temperature water. And now I need a bowl full of hot water. Hot from the tap, not from a kettle. I'm going to put this hand now in the ice cold water and this hand in the hot water. And I'm going to leave them there for one minute. And now I'm going to put both hands in the middle bowl, and that is really weird. So the hand that was in the ice water feels boiling hot, and the hand that was in the hot water feels freezing cold. I'm in a state of total neural confusion. Zand, what is going on? Well, for the hand that was in the cold water, the warm sensing nerves in Chris's skin became much more active, and all the cold senses were shut off. This fooled the brain into thinking his cold hand was hot. And for the hand in hot water, it was the other way around. So the cold sensing nerves in my skin became more active and all the hot senses were shut off. This fooled my brain into thinking my hot hand was cold. Try it out on your friends and confuse their brains. Ouch. Now we're hitting the hospitals to show you what goes on. Today, I'm meeting a special surgeon. I'm in this operating theatre with one of the best surgeons in the world. He's done hundreds of operations, he's seven years old, and he's got four arms. No, it's not a genetically engineered child mutant surgeon, it's a robot. What made you want to become a surgeon? Interesting. We're at Leeds General Hospital, and this robot, yes, robot, is going to perform surgery, and we've been allowed special access to show you how it works. And this is the surgeon that will operate the robot, Dr. Azad Najmaldin. So on the operating table is two-year-old Thomas, and he needs an operation on his stomach. And Dr. Azad's decided to use the robot because the robot arms can be put through small incisions rather than making a big incision on the tummy. That means when Thomas wakes up, he'll only have a few tiny scars instead of a big one. But before the robot can start operating, there's a lot of preparation to do. So just like surgeons get dressed in sterile clothing for operations, so does the robot. The team need to put the camera and robotic hands inside Thomas's tummy, and then Dr. Azad can drive the robot. So it looks completely terrifying, but this is actually very safe. The business end of the robot is that single pair of fingers that do this and rotate. Now, these very delicate movements can take place at the tips of those arms. And so our robot gets to work with Dr. Azad on the other side of the room. It might look like a computer game, but when it's controlled by a highly skilled expert like Dr. Azad, it can make intricate surgical movements. And what the robot does is it takes the big movements of the human hands and it shrinks them down and it gives Dr. Azad tiny robot hands inside the patient's body. And there's no need for him to be in the room or even in the country so he could be anywhere in the world, operating on a patient in Leeds. Thomas's surgery has gone well, so he's off back to the ward. And now it's my turn. I've never used this before, and I've got a massive challenge. To skin a grape. So I'm going to cut the skin on the grape. Just move down vertically like this. Surprisingly straightforward. I just don't know why everyone doesn't peel grapes like this. What do you think, Dr. Azad? Considering that this is his first encounter, he's doing pretty, pretty well. Obviously, for the grape, we're using a local anaesthetic, not a general anaesthetic. It's much safer. It's a minor operation. Yes, this is very cool. So this isn't just the world's most expensive grape peeler. Even with 15 minutes practice, I can see the enormous benefits that that will have for patients. This is definitely the future of surgery. Ouch. Now, don't worry. Zahn's not attempting to dance. He's spinning on the spot, but it is for a reason. Inside his inner ear, Zahn's got tubes full of fluid that send information to his brain about balance and movement. And when I stop, 
the fluid keeps moving. And this fools his brain into thinking he's still moving. With the fluid in Zahn's ears telling him he's moving, but his eyes telling him he's still, his brain is totally confused. And the result? I feel a bit sick. If you feel sick in a car, that's because your brain is confused too. As you travel, your eyes notice everything passing by quickly and tell your brain you're moving. But because you're sitting still in the car, your ears think you're not moving at all. And these mixed messages don't just happen in cars. But I'm about to take travel sickness to another level. This aerial display team specialises in aerobatic moves that will be way more confusing for Chris's brain than when I turned on the spot or you travel in a car. <laughs> do I have to do this? Yes, Chris, you do. Meet Mark Cutmore. He's the pilot who's going to take Chris up for a spin. You might think it's an odd time for a spot of lunch, but that sarnie should help to settle his stomach for the flight ahead. I just wonder if I'm going to be seeing the tuna mayonnaise sandwich again over the cockpit window in a few minutes. We'll soon find out. Safety gear on, it's time for Chris to take his seat. A sick bag. We call it a comfort bag. A comfort bag. <laughs> Come on, Chris, up you go. And they're off. Chris is travelling at speeds of up to 250 miles per hour, and so far, he seems to be doing OK. But let's bring on the crazy moves and see how he copes once his eyes and ears start confusing his brain. <laughs> this is a very unpleasant sensation. You and me are not meant to be upside down. Yeah, I'm fed of my stomach. The tuna sandwich! It will stay down. Now, in a situation like this, clearly Chris's eyes can see he is moving, and the fluid in his ears is moving too. So why does he feel sick? Oh, wow, I have no idea what's going on. Well, there are so many different movements happening at such high speed. His eyes and ears are failing to send the same messages at the same time to his brain. They're out of time with each other, and that's why he feels sick. Uh-oh. <laughs> As we touched down, I was definitely feeling the tuna sandwich returning for revenge. I mean, at the end, I did feel sick, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I was very pleased to be back on the ground. At least you've managed to keep your lunch down, though, Chris. But if you get travel sick, you can stop your brain getting confused. Don't look down and try looking out of the window at a fixed spot on the horizon. This will mean your eyes and ears are sending the same messages to your brain and you shouldn't feel sick.